We want to talk now about farmer interest in and challenges to the biosafety and bioproperty regimes that we've so far treated rather abstractly. We begin this course with the question, why GMOs? That section discussed the utility of genetic engineering for making crops useful to farmers. We then discussed, why not GMOs? We found that much opposition to GMOs is based on control of this technology by corporate giants the disadvantage of farmers. We also discussed opposition to GMOs on the grounds that biosafety regimes to counter potential risk would not be workable. The map you've seen of what crops can be grown in what countries reflects the official story on government reports. It only includes those things reported officially from various countries around the world. But how do we know what is actually going on in the millions of villages and isolated farms around the world? Off stage, off the record, out of sight. Farmers, like all of us, do not always follow all the rules. And this complicates the GMO debate. You probably have, at some time or the other, had some unauthorized, the uh, harsh word is pirated, software on your computer or some unpaid music or video. Most of us do. This is a huge phenomenon globally. Moises Naim wrote an important book called simply Illicit how smugglers, traffickers, and copycats are hijacking the global economy. Naim stressed what we all know intuitively. First, governments fail in controlling underground economies organized around many commodities from software to illegal drugs to human trafficking. We also know that firms have a hard time controlling their intellectual property claims, music, software, films, Every video in the United States starts with a scary warning from the FBI about copying, threatening criminal penalties. If people can copy software, pharmaceuticals, and industrial technology without authorization, and urban centers all over the world are filled with copycat or counterfeit products, why can't or won't farmers do the same thing with GMOs? If you can get a Rolex watch for five bucks in Shanghai, why not a bag of Monsanto seeds? Well, the answer is you can for many crops in many countries. Neither firms nor governments have the capacity or the incentive to police two hectare farmers in millions of villages. I call the result of this stealth seeds. Stealth seeds are genetically engineered seeds that are not approved for planting by biosafety regulators and do not include payment for technology fees or patents claimed by seed companies in countries where these are nominally applicable, which is not every country. Farmers in many countries have adopted stealth seed under the radar of firms and states whenever they confront high cost or unavailability or restrictive regulations of government approved biotech crops from corporate multinationals. No one knows the extent of diffusion of these illicit underground biotechnologies for obvious reasons. They're illegal but they are on every continent and often in widespread use. I first came across stealth seeds in Gujarat, in western India. There was then a political struggle over approval of BT cotton hybrids that had been going on for seven years. Then a huge infestation of bollworms devastated Gujarat's cotton crop in 2001. Yet amidst the devastation, there were patches of green and white these patches turned out to be cotton fields planted with illegal and unauthorized BT cotton with a trait that made the plants resistant to bollworms. So all the other hybrids were destroyed. These BT hybrids survived. It turned out the illegal BT cotton had been growing for three years, undetected by either seed firms or by the government. It contained a gene brought to India by Monsanto through its local partner, Maiko. There was no patent on the seed but the hybrid growing in Gujarat violated biosafety regulations. It had not been through the test approved in New Delhi. As a result, the central government ordered uprooting and destruction of the illegal crop. When the government in Delhi banned this hybrid, it was called Navbarat 151, local farmers bred new hybrids using local varieties with the transgenic parent plant. The result was what's been called a cottage industry in breeding dozens of illegal cotton hybrids with the transgene of the original. Many of these were cheap and effective 
and quite popular, especially before the price of official seeds came down dramatically in 2006. Illegal and underground stealth seeds of Bt cotton have not disappeared, but they have advanced their technology pretty dramatically. This phenomenon is not unique to India. When Argentina in 1995 refused a patent on GM soy to Monsanto, farmers saved seeds, eventually crossbred, backcrossed new transgenic varieties for their own use and for sale. These traveled across the southern cone of Latin America. I heard them referred to by a Brazilian football fan as Maradona seeds, since they were fast and elusive and came from Argentina. Likewise, China's public sector biotechnology program has had leakages of farmer-appropriated stealth seeds. Bt proteins were found in exports of rice flour starting in 2006 in Japan, the EU, and New Zealand, though Bt rice is not approved for cultivation in China. Chinese Bt cotton varieties likewise spread underground as well to much of Asia, including India. There are many other instances of gray market GMOs evading both biosafety and bioproperty regimes all over the world, including Europe. What does this mean for the GMO debate? First, the idea common in opposition circles that farmers are coerced into using a technology that harms them seems implausible. Farmers take risk to purchase, breed, exchange, and grow stealth seeds, taking risk that must be, on their own account, balanced by large benefits. Second, stealth practices of farmers contrary to the wishes of firms, states, and many NGOs, suggest a different model of the farmer than that often encountered in anti-GMO discourse. More active, creative, and autonomous, less hapless and supine. That understanding is important because so much of the literature against GMOs claims that farmers are victimized, their way of life destroyed. To the contrary, stealth practices show that farmers have agency. They know what works in their fields, they experiment, they make choices facing difficult circumstances, including the risk of prosecution. One implication is that we should take farmers' choices seriously in evaluating the many stories of GMO catastrophes. For example, if virtually all cotton farmers in India grow Bt cotton, as they do, the claim by Prince Charles and others that Bt cotton drives farmers to commit suicide, as we commonly read in sensationalist stories, becomes highly implausible. Just as stealth seeds give us an alternative view of farmers, they also allow us to see how bioproperty in GMOs appears less monopolistic and powerful on the ground, more relational and contingent than it appears in anti-GMO tracts. It's hard to imagine elaborate control of germplasm, that is, seeds sprout, seeds replicate. So the control mechanisms are almost impossible to imagine. Grounds for opposition to GMOs on bioproperty grounds are lessened accordingly. To summarize, absence of official regulatory approval does not always block benefits from diffusion of GM seeds. Official data on uptake and benefits of biotech crops therefore systematically understate the actual uptake and the benefits to farmers. But on balance, are stealth seeds good or bad for development? Unofficial networks of biotech seed production and distribution are more pro-poor than alternatives. They increase the use of technologies that farmers find useful, and they've posed no health or environmental problems to date. But it would be wrong to assume stealth seeds to be a solution to the problem of technological change driven by biotechnology. There are big limitations, except for cotton, hybrids will be largely excluded from the stealth seed market since they do not breed true. Also, the range of crops is mostly limited to widely used older GM commodity crops, for example, Bt cotton, herbicide tolerant soy. Not the frontier of development. Seed quality from unknown sources may also be an issue for farmers. Second, incentives for firms to pay for research and development are depressed by gray market copycat seeds which ultimately may limit technical progress. The final consideration is this. Is there not an increase in risk if biosafety regimes and regulation are so permeable? Probably not. The scientific consensus is that there are no unique or incremental risk of GM crops compared to 
conventionally bred crops. So all the money and personnel taken up by biosafety regimes may, in fact, be a waste. The scientific rationale for biosafety regimes has become more questionable as research results accumulate. Meta-analyses of differences between traits produced by genetic engineering and traits introduced by different methods of plant breeding show no evidence of significant differences. These findings from science raise new questions about the opportunity cost of the large sum spent on developing capacity for biosafety regimes and imposing restrictions on farmers.